And what I've learned in franchising is operations and sales have to talk to each other. If they don't talk to each other regularly, then what, ha what happens is they go in opposite directions eventually. And then the franchisee's here and he's like, I bought into this. And operations is like, no, this is how it actually really is. And so validation suffers. And then you see, you know, a potential collapse of a system, right? And so me and my, you know, I'm overseeing ops. I oversee sales. I oversee development. I oversee ongoing support, right? So like we can 100% be aligned. And so if franchise development saying one thing, operations is saying the same thing, then what ends up happening is the franchisees who launch end up saying the same thing. So everyone's saying the same exact thing of, hey, if you buy this, this is what happens. And then once I've bought it, this is what happened. And that's how you, that is like, tell any franchise, I'll tell any, any and every franchisor, that's how you be successful. You have to do those things. Welcome to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Each episode takes a deep dive into the franchise space and explores how the biggest and best brands handle national branding, franchise development, employee recruitment, and localized marketing on a daily basis. This podcast is brought to you by Medsertive, a localized digital marketing partner for franchise networks. Medsertive's Madeline Park talks shop with franchise executives to discuss what's working, what's not, and answers the question, what else can you be doing? to excel at the art of franchise marketing. Hey everyone, welcome back to the art of franchise marketing. I've got a fun one for you today. I feel like I say that every time, but like this genuinely is going to be a very nice banterful informational one. We've got Aaron Harper, the CEO of Rolling Suds. I'm sure you've seen them out and about all over LinkedIn. Aaron, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Maddie. I'm really excited to be here. So before we hit record, uh, we were talking about how many he sold and I'm kind of rolling my eyes going, oh, you are setting yourself up for failure with that kind of growth. And then he goes, oh, no, no, no. My background is in franchise development and I'm doing it internally. And I go, oh, shit, this guy <laughs> knows what he's doing. Um, so before we get into that, Aaron, tell me who you are, how you got into franchising, and you know what your your new role with Rolling Suds like? What's that all about? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I come I come from a franchising background. Rolling Suds is a power washing franchise. I got into it with zero power washing experience, other than a couple failed times of using a three hundred dollar machine and burning a Sunday. Uh, you know, not knowing what I'm doing um, when my wife says you need to clean the house. So that was my experience with power washing before I got involved with rolling suds. Um, but you know, my niche in franchising is boring businesses. Um, I uh, I got involved uh, years ago with a brand called ChemDry, um, which has been around a long time. Carpet cleaning. Uh, that's the biggest carpet cleaning company in the world. I helped scale that until Belfort bought it. Belfort bought it. They put us in charge of their franchise division, asked us to scale that franchise division into a multi-brand platform like Threshold or Neighborly or uh, any of these other kind of platform companies. Um, and then um, they brought a brand called the Patch Boys. They asked me to get involved with the Patch Boys and help grow that brand. Um, I took that brand from uh, October of 2020 to October of 2022, grew that brand by 223 units in 24 months. Um, what I'm super proud of is all of those units opened and they opened in the time we said they were going to open by. So every uh, eight days when I left, a new franchisee was signing up and every seven weeks or so, we were launching seven franchise groups across the country. Um, they were all opening with jobs lined up the first week they got back from training. They had a skilled laborer hired prior to going to training. Um, so we built some really cool systems. Uh, we had also at the same time grown Belfort to 12 brands. Um, 4,700 locations, 55 countries. So we went from three brands to 12. Um, they asked me to get involved with the 13th brand they were going to buy. It was a business. It wasn't a franchise yet. And they asked me to help grow that and help franchise that brand. Um, I respectfully declined the role because I wanted to do it on my own. So I started searching for businesses that I could franchise, looked at about two dozen across the country, all boring businesses uh, as a, you know you're very familiar with mm -hmm. um, and uh, met the founders of rolling suds in september hands down the best business i evaluated incredible guys incredible family business we partnered in january of this year we started franchising in february um, and as of uh, today we've sold 21 units across six states 
um, and um, we're opening them uh, at the same rate. So we've opened eight, we're opening 10 uh, next week, um, and then in November we'll be opening uh, more. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, National Power, I'm the CEO, uh, owner of the company as well, um, raised uh, a ton of money to do it the right way, and, and I'm married, I've got a two-year-old son and an eight-month-old daughter, so if you didn't think I was crazy before, do some quick back-of-the-napkin math, and uh, wife was seven months pregnant when I decided I was going to do this, um, <laughs> and I'm still here with you today, I'm, I'm sitting and, 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 you know, made it, so luckily, I mean, that's why we have good partners, right, she said, I know you're going to take care of us. So that's my background in a very quick nutshell. Uh, yeah, I've got questions, but <laughs> yes, I love it. I love, you know, we are bred from home services. So, you know, we'll definitely have a lot to talk about there. I think that there's probably a lot of franchisors on here now going, shit, I kind of want him to do my friend Dev, but he <laughs> owns his own company. So great. <laughs> and also, you know, we also own a competing power washing franchise men in kilts and we had zero experience going into it i still have zero experience i just right. marketed it but yeah we have a lots of uh destroyed items from my husband just being like well i could power wash that break something in half you know yep. all of that good stuff i remember one time he lifted one of the generators that you have to have in the truck right Yep. by himself and he said oh i'm gonna feel that tomorrow sure fine and then the next day he wakes up he's like no maddie i know i know i always think something's wrong but something's wrong we need to go to the hospital i'm having a heart attack like this is oh, no joke no. i'm having a heart attack and i was like it couldn't be because you lifted the power washing generator yesterday by yourself <laughs> and he's like oh yeah never mind <laughs> yeah so let's get into this rolling suds growth yep the first question I asked you was, are you using, you know, an outsourced franchise sales development team? Because usually when you hear about this growth, they've got an outside team doing it for them, signing the contracts, and then, you know, the franchisor is the one onboarding them and kind of getting ready for operations. But right. you're doing this yourself, which tells me one, he, you know, you already, you know what it takes to open these units. And I like that you, you put into account, you know, in your history of you were proud of the ones that opened, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, I've got 150 in development. They don't, a lot of people don't realize 75% of those usually won't even open, right? Yeah. So the fact right. that you've had them contracted, opened and doing well is, is a huge testament to, you know, your success in the industry and the brands overall. So talk to me about this franchise development, you've got incredible momentum. Where are you getting your leads? Are you focusing on converting businesses? Or are they just walking in the door? Cause I'm sure a lot of brands are going, well, what the hell, man, you know, sh yeah. share the fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm fortunate in the sense that I did most of those deals, um, that I did with patch boys and found those, those candidates, um, through one broker network. Mm -hmm which is Franserve. Sure. Um, so my ties are very close within Franserve. They, they basically say I'm an official, an unofficial member of, of Franserve. Um, even though I'm a, I'm a franchisor and not a, not a consultant. Um, a lot of, a lot of franchisors will, as you know, split their time across 10 different broker networks and go to all the different conferences and do all that kind of stuff. I don't have the time to do that because my, um, my relationships are so close within that, that network, they know not only if they introduce someone to me, will they have a very high likelihood of joining um, Rolling Suds, but also they're going to have a high likelihood of being successful and, and open. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm fortunate in the sense I, I know that's not uh, very easily replicable. Um, <laughs> so I, I did come into being a franchisor with, with uh, a big kind of leg up. Um, on the franchise development side of things due to those um, relationships. Uh, so I was able to kind of pick up almost exactly where I left off. Um, we're signing up about two new units per week right now. Um, and instead of a franchisee signing up every eight days, it's about 15 days or so. And so you're getting all of these leads through, you know, Franserve. Are you running digital marketing campaigns on top of that? Or are you guys just focused on that broker network right now? We are uh, we are not we are okay. not spending any dollars on um, digital advertising for franchise development. 
And then how do you justify the cost? Because obviously when you sign with a broker that's 25, 30 K off the top, how are you justifying that to your partners, your bottom line? Um, because I think a lot of franchises look at that and they say, oh, no way. You know, I can't afford that or I can't do that. Well, so what I'll say is most of the people who have the, as you mentioned at the beginning of this, have this growth because they join a franchise sales organization mm -hmm. and they're paying even more, mm -hmm. right? Because they're paying the FSO, they're paying a monthly retainer, they're paying for all the leads, they're paying sure. for the conferences, they're paying for the digital advertising. And in addition to that, they're paying a broker fee. My cost structure um, with the consultants that I work with um, allows me to reinvest mm -hmm. the franchise uh, fee mm -hmm. uh, into infrastructure in a way <clears throat> in a way that allows me to, to, to build the team at the same time mm -hmm. that I'm building the franchise system. And you know what, what I what I also say is like to any franchisor who's listening is there you know the, the biggest reason why franchisors fail is due to a lack of capital. Okay, and it's not just like money in the bank capital, it's intellectual capital as well on how to franchise a business because it's a right. different business. The franchise business is the different is a different business than whatever the core widget is, whether it's power washing or, you know, closets or garages or, or whatever it is. And um, I raised an, an incredible amount of capital so that I could front load uh, the infrastructure. Um, so we have, um, you know, about as many employees as franchisees right now, including me and the founders. Mm -hmm. And that's very important for me. Um, and so to be able to do that, you need, you need either access to capital. And if you're giving all your franchise fees away to an FSO or a, a broker, you need to have even more capital. Um, mm -hmm. but the way that my cost structure is set up, I'm able to take the franchise fee that people invest with me and invest it into infrastructure to support them. That's really, really great advice. And it's very generous of you to share that take because I think a lot of times it's glossed over of like, well, you're investing it back and you know, you know, you'll have, you know, it might be break even until you get those royalties in and stuff, but that, that broke it down um, in a very clear way of, yeah, you, if you want leads and you know, you're, you're going to pay these brokers or FSOs or both, um, you need to have even more capital to do that. You know, there is, it's funny because I talked to someone today that said, can you help me with my friend Dev? And they said that their budget was $3,000 and they wanted to sign four or five units by the end of the year. And I'm doing the math in my head and I'm like, well, I know an average, you know, cost per acquisition for a brand new brand is, you know, an average for mid-level is around 30. A new brand's probably 45, 50. Right. You're telling me you're gonna give me 3K, you want me to open five <laughs> units in four months. And I'm like, this is not consumer marketing. It doesn't work like that. Like there is right. such a significant um, investment in time and money that I think a lot of people underestimate. You know, even, you know, NetSertive, they do Fran Def now and we presented uh, a proposal with no fees in it, just the proposal of what they wanted in terms of spend and he, they were like, this is, you know, $1.3 million. I was, they're like, right. why are you presenting this? I said, you wanted to open 60 units and like you're a brand new brand. What, what number did you think it was going to be? Like, so, you know, that's just a very yeah. good call out to the fact that, you know, the intellectual capital and the capital capital needs to be there before you even, you know, consider going into franchising. So my next question now is, you know, you've got these units, you know what it takes to be a successful franchisor and sell them. How are you handling one validations? Because you are a, a newer brand, so you don't have these, you know, tenured franchisees that can attest to it. And two, you know, how are you marketing your national brand, your national marketing um, to franchisees that technically are the ones that have to build it, that don't have it? So right. I know a lot of emerging brands struggle with, we say that we're a national brand, but we're brand new. So how do we sell that? Right. Uh, my background, mm -hmm. that's the validation. Yeah. Um, this is what I've done in the past. We're using similar systems to what I did in the past. We've amplified them. I've added additional infrastructure. Now I'm in charge, right? So mm -hmm. I can guarantee, I can basically 
now I'm in control of what happens to the franchisee after they sign. Mm -hmm. And this is our plan. Now, the people who buy into an emerging brand and they're one of the first 10 to 15 or 20, even 20 franchisees, they have to be more entrepreneurial than, than the guy who buys in at 100 units mm -hmm. or 150 units. So my, my goal is, is uh, the path that we're on is, is to become the biggest power washing company in the world. And, um, and that's, that's the goal and I see a path to that. So people who come in right now, they're buying into the, that, that, that effort and them being a part of that, that effort. Now what I'll tell you is out of the seven franchisees that we've signed up since February, three of them have expanded to another territory. Wow. So, and two of them were, bef excuse me, uh, three of them, they were before they even opened. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll take more, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> so the experience that they had obviously decided, Aaron, I'm gonna invest another $40,000 in a franchise fee because I know that it won't be available. Um, mm -hmm. in six months or a year. And you've treated me in, in this way and you've delivered on everything you said you were gonna deliver on. And as a result, I wanna double down. Um, and so that's validation. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we, we basically help make sure that franchisees have estimates and jobs lined up, you know, the week that they get back from training. Mm -hmm. um, we're now turning leads on even weeks before training, teaching franchisees how to estimate and start selling jobs before they even go to training. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, because I, I handle the franchise development on the front end and I oversee the operations, I'm able to make sure that everyone's saying the same thing. One of the biggest challenges that franchisors have, especially in the case of hiring an FSO, franchise sales organization, is operations and development don't talk to each other and they typically have different goals. And right. so they have different perspectives on how, which type of franchise you should come in on the operation side. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, on the, on the franchise sales side, how many units they should sell, potentially whether or not they should be actively involved or passively involved, which is a, a whole other problem um, that I don't even want to get into. Um, <laughs> um, it's insane. So, uh, so in, in what I've learned in franchising is operations and sales have to talk to each other. Yeah. If they don't talk to each other regularly, then what, ha what happens is they go in opposite directions eventually. And then the franchisee's here and he's like, I bought into this and operations is like, no, this is how it actually really is. And so validation suffers. And then you see, you know, a potential collapse of a system. Right. Mm -hmm. And so me and my, you know, I'm overseeing ops, I oversee sales, I oversee development, I oversee ongoing support, right? So like we can 100% be aligned. And so if franchise development saying one thing, operations is saying the same thing, then what ends up happening is the franchisees who launch end up saying the same thing. So everyone's saying the same exact thing of, hey, if you buy this, this is what happens. And then once I've bought it, this is what happened. And that's how you, that is like, Tell any franchise, I'll tell any, any and every franchisor, that's how you be successful. You have to do those things. And um, yeah, we're gonna get real with it right now. Um, listen, I love my franchisor. I was, I helped create Threshold, like all that. So if they're at the Threshold's listening, I love you guys, but you know what I'm about to say. <laughs> we, and it wasn't even through an FSO that typically, and if any FSOs are listening, Love y'all too, but we're talking about the ops and the sales thing here is sometimes they over promise because yeah. they're, they have no skin in the game oftentimes right. when it comes to operations. And that's what happened um, with our power washing is, you know, and I, we were talking before my husband's in a franchisee for over 20 years. I'm a professional in marketing. Like we, we get it. We're not, you know, right. you know, rose colored glasses, but we were promised the world expecting maybe the moon, you know, right. but it's, right. it's been like, not like it's been like right. an eclipse and we're sitting here going, hold on. Like, how are you this off on a performa? How right. are you this off? And now, you know, you're not growing and people are angry cause there's no validations and then this and that and the other thing. So, you know, what you're saying is completely right is you, you could have given us, and I don't even think they, they necessarily gave us the wrong numbers, but they gave us numbers that they really hoped would happen. Right. You know, the best of the best. So in essence, telling one story 
we lived a different one and now there's a validation in which there is a huge delta that we can't necessarily cover one way or the other you know we want our franchise to grow we love them but i also i'm not going to talk to this new franchisee about something that they're not going to get so you know making sure everyone is telling the right story is is, is very very important and impressive um and you know to go back to a call out in terms of validations for a new franchise you know obviously for our emerging franchisors listening here you can't say uh in your validations well trust Aaron Harper because they don't all have Aaron Harper but right. the, what they're what the point of what Aaron is saying is why do they want to go into business with you right you know if you can't even say why they should go into business with you if you don't have an elevator pitch for yourself let alone your business that is something that you need to craft if you're an emerging brand because again you don't have those validations you don't have the historical data but you do have you you have your mission and you have your goals and that's what you need to rely on if you're not comf confident in doing that how can you expect anyone else to be confident in you as their boss their franchisor um now you know i mean i feel like i talked to you all day but i want to move on to this part and you know you talked about as they open you're turning leads on they're you're getting jobs scheduled for their first week of operation which is so important for new franchisees because immediately they're just seeing cash flow out cash flow out um what does your marketing stack look like because you said that your your home office stack is you know you're ready to support so what does right. your marketing look like and and what's working and the reason i ask is because i think a lot of um older franchisors still say, you know, they still are hoping for the tables to turn back to where they could do, you know, one mailer and know that the ROI was, I can spend $45 and get a new client. And we know as newer brands that that's not right. possible. So what does your stack look like to ensure that as new franchisees come on, you're able to get them leads and get them jobs and show them success right away? Yeah, so for emerging franchisors, <clears throat> they need to figure out, you need to figure out who your suppliers are because an emerging franchisor can't do everything, right? There's certain things that need to be outsourced, especially when you're a brand new brand. So before I even launched, I spent six to seven months negotiating with marketing suppliers mm -hmm. and, and ones that can deliver uh, for franchisees. Some of them I had worked with in the past. Um, so I had that experience in the past, but, um, and then coming up with a plan, right? So part of what franchisees give us to start the business, I then give to my director of marketing mm -hmm. and she then invests that and manages that whole process for six months. We require that franchisees spend a certain amount monthly in addition to that. And then they have a dashboard that shows where all that capital is going on a monthly basis. So a lot of franchisors will do like, you need a grand opening budget of 10 grand and you need to spend this on your first grand opening and yada, yada, yada. I try to take off all of that off of their plate, right? It's a tremendous amount of infrastructure on our end. We have to build, like, we have to have basically one full employee to do that and then if we have 100 friends, like, it's a whole thing. However, what I want franchisees to do is focus on revenue generating activities. Mm -hmm. So what are those revenue generating activities? Well, it's developing relationships with painting companies and window cleaners and uh, real estate agents and commercial property management companies. And so what I do in the, in, the, in the franchise development process is set the expectation, here's what we're gonna do for those first six months. And here's what you're gonna do. And I want you to hold us accountable for what we're gonna do. And because we're gonna hold you accountable for, for what we need you to do, right? Our mission statement at Rolling Suds is this is a relationship. You don't get a $20,000 like parking structure job because someone typed in power washing near me and chose the first guy on Google. Like you get it because you have a relationship where that person says, call Rolling Suds or call Men in Kilts. They can handle it for you. So what we try to do at Rolling Suds is take off that piece off the plate and then on month seven, it's like, hey, you have these six months, of, this six months of data, keep spending this amount of money with those suppliers. And then as an emerging franchisor, you have to figure out who your customers are. And you have to come up with a plan on how to market to those customers. So we're 50% residential, we're 50% commercial. So we need a commercial lead gen pro program as well. And so we have that. 
we have vendors who we've worked with for years that do outbound commercial lead gen and they bring franchisees everything on a paper lead basis hmm. and so so now it's it's what are we doing and what are you doing and and how and are the proper expectations set on the front end if you're not if you're over promising and you're under delivering because you're saying hey all the leads are going to be generated and you don't have to do anything you just have to sit back the phone will ring and you'll bring in all this money and check in on your PL once every two hours a month and you like if you if that's happening then basically what's happening is the, the the organization who's selling it or the sales guy or whatever is lying and then the franchisee has to figure out how to be successful on their own right. and, and and that is a a cancer in mm -hmm. franchise and i like that you said you know especially with your history as you know a absolute and you know this doesn't even cover it, but a franchise expert and you're sitting here saying no there are some things as an emerging brand that you have to outsource that you need to do you need to understand your your strengths and your weaknesses and i i talk a lot about this too because i think that there's some sort of stigma around you know build it or buy it and it's better if you do it internally and yada 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 and it's just not it's not the truth and there's different seasons for different things maybe rolling suds grows up and they said, oh, we can 100% handle this, you know, in-house. Or maybe they acquire the vendor that, you know, there's right. there's different things. So it's not that once you build it, you always have to stick with it. Once you are a vendor, you always have to stick with it. Um, and that sort of thing. And I like that you pointed out also accountability. I think that that's one of the biggest benefits of using vendors is because it's very easy to hold them accountable. And right. they want to do well because, again, they have skin in the game. Like, they don't want to lose your business. Right. Um, I worked on a franchisor that had, uh, um, we did it internally and it became very difficult to audit ourselves because now right. you have people that you work right next to and you're saying, well, I don't think they're really doing their job, but like, how do right. I, how do I say that? You know? So right. you know, there's definitely some checks and balances there that can be, can be really beneficial. Um, and we're coming up on time, but I want to cover now what's next for rolling suds. Obviously, you've got your operations that are growing, your brand dev is continuing to grow. What do you want to see in the next five to 10 years outside of world domination? But, <laughs> you know, is it that you are going to bring on another brand? Is it that you want to grow to, you know, a bunch of different countries? You know, what are in your headlights right now? Yeah, so what's in my headlights like immediately is bringing on the right people. So mm -hmm. we've turned away 19 owners that wanted to sign. They had checks, they wanted to write checks. They were like, let's do it. And I was like, they're not the right people mm -hmm. because you bring in the wrong people into a system and it can be a huge detriment, right? And I've been doing this long enough to where it's like, all right, I know this person, at least I, in my gut, I feel like this person is gonna be successful and this person's not. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing to just say, in addition to merging franchisors, is like really identify who is gonna be successful in your system and why and then go after that specific avatar. However you go after that avatar, whether it's through consultants or whether it's through um, digital advertising, focus on that. So in the immediate, it's bringing in the right people. In addition to that, it's bringing in the right people on, on the franchisor side. Mm -hmm. When you're building a brand from one unit, one corporate unit to you know, what we're gonna become, the people who come in at this stage help shape the culture of the brand, right? So. And I'm big on culture. I'm really big on culture. You need to have a community that you're part of. Long term, over the course of the next five years, to answer your question, uh, four, 500 units, um, every major market, uh, having multiple franchisees um, within it, each franchisee being um, a multi-unit owner. Um, so we don't bring in one unit owners. We do a minimum of two, maximum of three. We will consider more than three if you've built and scaled a business before, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis based on qualifications and capital type situations only. Um, and then happy franchisees, like happy, successful franchisees. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that, and the way I've learned to do that is you have to help franchisees achieve their why. Every franchisee has a different why, right? And so what we do internally, um, and anyone, any emerging franchisor can steal this, I'm completely cool with it, um, is we have a why call before they even open. Why are you doing this? 
tell me every, and we have like a whole series of questions that we ask and the coach and the director of marketing are on there. And then we put that in their file. And then anytime things get hard, which they're of course gonna get hard, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a business. We come back to the why, we come back to the solution and what, what can we do to continue to achieve that? Um, and, and that is what I think a successful franchise system is, is a bunch of happy franchisees achieving their why. And, um, and then getting the, the franchisees who aren't in the right seat out and getting someone into that territory who is, right? Which is like, it's the most compassionate thing to do is find a solution that that person can go achieve their why elsewhere. I mean, there's no way to add 100 units in a year and not have people that want to, that, that aren't right. Like it's, it's just going to happen. And, um, and I don't think that's a problem with the system. I think that there are certain people that I want to become a power washing franchisee. And then they say, hey, you know what? I want to go actually go work in finance. That was, that was, I was happy with that. And like, that's okay. But the franchisor, we have to have a plan to help them get out. And we have that. We, we, we built that now. Um, so that, that inevitably does happen. We have a plan. Um, but yeah, 450 ish unit system, um, entering other markets. I've already had someone from the UK reach out. Um, I'm like, how do we get a truck out there? We can, I guess we I can start calling people around. You, you got to fly at Emirates like they do for the uh, Olympics. They fly the horses yeah. on Emirates just on these huge <laughs> planes. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess I got to find some new suppliers. What's the difference in time? I guess eight <laughs> hours. All right. I guess Sarah, what, you know, my wife, I, I'll, yeah. I'll be working from eight o'clock, you know, 10 o'clock at night. But mm -hmm. That's the plan is to is to do that. Uh, the industry as a whole right now, um, we hear this all the time in home services fragmented, but like it truly is. There's, uh, I looked at about two dozen different businesses to franchise and every business that I looked at, typically there would be local operators that were doing really well in the case of HVAC, for example, but then there'd be five to 10 other franchise brands and they'd all be in a market in Chicago and they'd all be doing well, uh, seemingly. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in power washing. We've got local guys who do this on their own and we don't have a national brand. I know you guys are in men and kilts, but you guys do exterior cleaning, you do gutters, you do these other services. We just focus on residential and commercial power washing and we're gonna focus on that niche forever. We're not adding other services, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. We're just gonna become the experts, um, you know, and the national brand for that. And um, so that's, that's kind of, I, I hope that answers your question. Oh, uh, it more than answers that. And I really just want to call appreciating the fact that, yeah, you're not going to go 100 for 100. You know what I mean? And that's there's there's outside circumstances that can influence that. And it all going back to, you know, that franchisee's why. And also understanding that helping them achieve that elsewhere is not a failure on your end. You know, right. we used to have like the segmented offices that were in distress and they, they would get even more resources. And then eventually we realized Sure, there might be some that need a little extra lift as they learn business ownership, but there is some that it's just not the right fit. And right. sometimes that you won't ever discover that until you do that. Um, so that was really great. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for coming on The Art of Franchise Marketing. I would like to say I look forward to seeing Ro Rolling Sud soon, but honestly, <laughs> you're just going to make my marketing more of a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the bubble socks that you, the contest that you did. Um, for anyone who wants to see it, go check, go check it out on LinkedIn, um, and be ready for a rolling suds near you. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks for listening to the Art of Franchise Marketing. This show is brought to you by Netsertive. We help franchise brands and multi-location businesses run localized digital marketing at scale. To learn more, visit netsertive.com.